is Reza? He's a wise man. He has experienced the heights and depths of life. Reza is a world-class photographer who takes his camera into the trenches of today's hottest conflicts. He, he is, is not, not afraid, afraid to, to do anything. anything. He, he risks, risks his life, life all the time. time. I'm taking my camera as a gun against the war. I'm pointing my camera as my gun against those guys that making the war, killing those innocent. The pictures are worth a thousand words, but in many ways Reza's pictures are worth 10,000 words. Reza is a man with a golden eye. He's better than that. He has a golden heart and a golden eye. He's a man on a mission. It's so important to Reza to, to bring the world together. And I think he's going to try to do it single-handedly. Reza's remarkable story begins here in Paris, his home base. Today, something very special is taking place, and Reza is making it happen. He's always making things happen. This time, he's trying to raise money for Afghanistan, so he's convinced the French Senate to host a fundraiser. Unique things happen today. According to the French law, you cannot sell or buy these things inside the Senate, but the idea was so exceptional that the president of the Senate himself, he said, I will find a uh, legal way, I will sign a, a new law. When Reza has an idea, people listen. As one of the world's elite photojournalists, his works have been featured in countless international newspapers and magazines, including Newsweek, Time, and Le Figaro. Since 1991, Reza has photographed 13 stories for the National Geographic magazine, including four covers. Tonight, some of his most memorable shots from Afghanistan will go on the auction block. The highlight of the evening will be the sale of his camera, his much-loved Leica, used to take his most famous pictures. What could compel one of the world's top photographers to sell his favorite camera? The answer unfolds thousands of miles away, in Afghanistan. Reza was exiled from his homeland neighboring Iran as a young man. Afghanistan has become a second home for him, helping shape who he is and becoming a part of his soul. I start 1979 as a professional photographer and Russian invaded Afghanistan in 79 too. So this was also beginning of the two stories that was going between me and Afghanistan and building up and building up and building up. For more than two decades, he's tried to show what happens when innocent lives are caught in the conflict of war and give a voice to those who are suffering. Today, Reza is in the streets of Kabul. He meets two seven-year-olds who are picking up trash to use for fuel. He wants to tell their story. The happy people, they have no story. And I'm a storyteller. I'm doing war against the war with my pictures. The children and women are really the ones that are suffering, the main victims. That's why I'm trying to just explain and show that injustice is actually, it's a global injustice. After 22 years of war, Afghanistan is a country of countless widows and orphans. These girls lost their fathers. They're taking Reza home to meet their families. You never go in a house in Afghanistan without a gift for them. And I know what they need, which they haven't seen probably for years, is a one kilo of the meat. I want to go to see the families where they're living and how they're living. 
The mother is very sick, with severe headaches and chest pain. She is unable to take care of her four children. He is the only son. It's the only income they have is from him selling water on the street. Her job is to bring uh, what they need to cook. She's responsible for the fire and he's responsible for the water. And uh, his income is around 30 cents per day. So what he's getting, they can only buy only three bread per day for four people. Somehow, their problem is related 100% in a way that the Western countries people treating them. Somehow, they are poor because there are too many rich in the Western country. And I think this is the, the reason that I'm sitting here. Uh, this is the reason that I was following Nadra and the other girl all around here. <clears throat> and this is also the reason that all my works just to became a medium between the people in the world, the one that living like this, and the people in the Western countries. Reza is working to bridge the gap between affluence and poverty. His efforts are coordinated here in Paris. His office, called Webistan, is always open, and rooms are filled with family, friends, and colleagues who share Reza's vision of the world. He's created an environment that's very similar to his boyhood home in Tabriz, a small town in northwest Iran. His father, a government official, entertained many of the community's intellectuals, exposing Reza to a world of ideas at a very young age. We had a very deep education in the literature and the history of Iran. We were taught the words of the very big, famous Persian poets, thinkers, or um, important uh, pillar of our education, the, our, of our culture, of our civilization. Reza's education instilled early on a love for freedom of thought and speech. I find out when I was 14 years old that my tool of expression will be the camera. Now I'm 49, so it makes 35 years. Every time I take pictures, I have the same feeling of the first picture that I've taken. It's the same boiling uh, happening in my heart and my mind. It was a passion he shared with his brother, Manusher. A passion that in the tightly censored time of the Shah of Iran would get Reza into trouble. When he was 16, he set out to expose the social injustices of the Shah's regime by secretly taking photographs and pasting them on public walls at night, only to have them torn down by the Shah's secret police the next morning. It was a dangerous game of cat and mouse. What followed would haunt Reza for the rest of his life. After six years, the Shah's secret police finally caught up with Reza. At age 22, he was arrested and thrown into prison. Then the torture started. And it takes five months, day and night, 24 hours. Any times after night, they were coming in and putting eye bands and taking me and torturing me, all kind of the torture. Electric shocks and not letting you move for 24 hours and not letting you sleep for three days. But all this was nothing compared to a form of torture the guards sadistically called Apollo, because the victim looked like an astronaut. Strapped straight-legged into a chair, Reza's feet were beaten with a wire hose until the tiny veins exploded. The pain was excruciating. 
a bucket placed over his head reverberated his screams. Amazingly, these five months of torture didn't break Reza's spirit. Instead, it helped shape the person he would later become. When I look back now, to these five months, for example, which I was put in an individual cell and tortured, I find that something was coming up out of this pain and out of this torture. And this was the deep understanding of a human, not only me, but also all those people that were in front of me. So I was experimenting extremes of the humans, of the quality and of the resistance. And this became a real game for me, saying that how much my body and my brain can resist this torture. And this is how you are starting creating an incredible relation between your brain and your body to control the pain by thinking totally different things and how you can do it and what is the way to control pain. And the guy is torturing you and some other guy is shouting, tell me the name of the people and blah, 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 all those things. And I have started to thinking totally other thing. In my mind, sometimes I was singing a song or reciting a poetry. Throughout the ordeal, his family feared the worst as they waited for news of his whereabouts. We didn't know for three months, we had no news. They wouldn't tell us where he is and what is he doing or if he's alive, if he's not. And it took us a while before just going to see him for a few minutes. And it was really shocking to see him. He had lost a lot of weight. He's, he couldn't, he could barely walk because of the texture of his feet. His sister, Parisher, made many of the family visits to the prison. It was a painful time, but his family understood the scope of Reza's commitment. We are also proud of him because he was fighting for his uh, uh, beliefs and for the democracy in our country, for freedom. 22 years later, Reza now has a family. Two children, Delazat and Janan. His French wife, Rachel, learned Reza's language, Farsi, and studied many of Iran's traditions. She works closely with Reza on many of his projects. <laughs> she was reciting by heart the Persian Iranian uh, national uh, song. <laughs> Iran is Reza's homeland, but he may never see it again. When he was released from prison, revolution was brewing in Iran. The Shah of Iran is exiled and dethroned. Soon after, the Ayatollah Khomeini assumes power. Amidst growing anti-American sentiment, a crowd of 500 Iranians stormed the gates of the US Embassy eventually taking 52 American diplomats hostage. Reza is there to capture the only photos. It's his big break. By morning, his work is on the front pages of newspapers all over the world. For the ensuing 444 days of the hostage crisis, Reza is Newsweek's correspondent outside the embassy. The magazine dubs him the 53rd hostage.
But Reza soon realizes a free press is no more welcome under the revolutionary regime than it was under the Shah. He hears that the Kurds are being persecuted by the new government. So he travels undercover to get their story. To his horror, the Republic is killing its own people, not a news item they would want leaked. For 17 days, Reza travels covertly to get the story, cutting off all contact with the outside world. When he finally calls his press agency, his obituary has already been written. Is it Reza? Ah, 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 ah. I said, what's going on? I said, you are dead. I said, what do you mean I'm dead? He said, everybody's <laughs> giving you dead here. Reza's photos break the story of atrocities against the Kurds. Blacklisted again, it won't be long before the regime's secret squad begins looking for him. But Reza's relentless in his determination. His years in prison actually strengthened his resolve to expose injustice. He sets his sights on the Iran-Iraq war and risks his life to cover it. With forged identity papers, Reza makes his way to the front line, where an incoming mortar round determines his fate. And I got uh, three um, shrapnels in my hand here. And I fell down, and dust going down, and people crying, and blood going all over. And I remember my first reaction was grab my camera and put my hand on the uh, first taking pictures of my hand. As a war casualty, he slips through the cracks to a hospital in France. Walking to the plane, Reza snaps a shot with his camera. It's the last photo he ever takes in Iran. And this was 21st March, 1981. 7.25 a.m. Paris has a tradition of welcoming exiles and artists. 20 years ago, Reza was both. And he was not alone. Thousands of Iranians left their country after the Shah was deposed. The Paris community tries to stay in touch at regular gatherings. Being an exile makes one thing easy. You can make any place your home. As a citizen of the world, Reza speaks nine languages fluently. Throughout the past 20 years, Reza has covered most of the world's hotspots and photographed some of its most controversial figures. But above all, one man captured his admiration. A little-known Afghan resistance leader who was fighting the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. In April 1985, Reza went looking for a man the whole Soviet army couldn't find. It was a treacherous trek through a no man's land of blockades and skirmishes. Finally, after a three month journey, Reza found him, the rebel leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud. He was different from other leaders Reza had grown to mistrust. A reluctant warrior, his dream is to be a school teacher in a free Afghanistan. The two men form an immediate bond. They were very close, I think, and close personalities. I think he, he, he considered Masoud as a kind of brother. The end, in little by little in conversation with him, I found that he has more interest to the culture than ever, everything else. He was a real deeply intellectual for me, a philosopher, a thinker, a poet. 
Reza and Masood used to read about Romy, and Romy always talks about this human soul being in chains unless he breaks the shackles and really becomes emancipated. Unless one has suffered, you cannot truly relate to these individuals who are also suffering. And I think Reza, having gone through that period of suffering in prison in Iran, that he's able to relate to people's stories. When the two part ways, Reza and Masood make a pact. Someday, they will enter Kabul together after the Soviets are beaten. Seven years later, Masood personally lifts Reza onto his tank as he captures the capital. Feeling that I am the only foreign journalist on these tanks was giving me something more than a pride. The Soviets leave the country in ruin. The United Nations faces the momentous task of rebuilding Afghanistan. Knowing Reza's reputation and how the Afghans trust him, the UN asks for his help in rebuilding the country. But he fears his efforts will be slowed by UN red tape. I can do it, but one condition. I said, what is condition? I said, I cannot do it through UN bureaucracy, but I can do it if you give me a little open hand. And they agree. Reza is a free mind. He's a free soul. He doesn't want to accept that a country like Afghanistan, like Cambodia, like Iran, can be managed by Western, uh, Western countries like France or US. He doesn't want to accept this because he knows, because he travels so much, he knows the quality of the people, he knows their integrity, he knows about their culture and they are as important as Western cultures. Reza puts his photographic career on hold for nine months to lead 10,000 Afghan workers. They distribute food and help rebuild schools, clinics, and roads. Reza is so fulfilled trying to help this country get back on its feet he considers giving up his photographic career forever. But then he gets a call from Washington, D.C. The National Geographic magazine wants Reza to do a story, a plum assignment for any photographer. Reza now faces a tough choice, a career in photography or continue his humanitarian work. A legless beggar boy will help seal his decision. Reza decides to accept the assignment for National Geographic magazine on location in Cairo, Egypt. His first article that features a legless beggar boy being whipped by his handler grabs the hearts of countless readers. In a split-second decision, Reza intentionally leaves the handler's head out of frame. Picture editor Ellie Rogers admires Reza's composition. You have to look at the shadow. You miss the point of the whole picture if you don't look at the shadow. So it makes the reader participate in making the picture work. That is what separates a humdrum picture from something special. Like many of Reza's pictures, this one called people to action. Many, many people wrote in and said, what can we do for this child? We want to contribute some money to help this child. The experience confirmed for Reza that he could touch more people with his photography by bringing awareness to parts of the world that are often ignored. Children is coming out of the village, and I saw them in a small village. Reza sees the whole world with a great freshness and enthusiasm. <laughs> and he speaks the, the language of children. I mean, he's just a universal person. <laughs> <laughs> when Reza and Rachel met 13 years ago, it was the melding of two mediums. 
Their first collaboration was a campaign created for kids. Rachel, a gifted writer, provides the words for Reza's photos. The messages are simple and direct. I want to learn. I'm not born for war. Let me play. There is no distance between the child and him. The innocence, it's something very precious. And I think that Reza has still that kind of innocence. Sometimes people look at me and say, you, you act like a child, like a small child. And I said, well, I seen it. I was actually. <laughs> I was not acting. I, I, I told them, I really, I was. I was playing with them, and I was like one of them. With a strong interest in children's issues, Reza and Rachel were horrified when widespread violence erupted in Rwanda in 1994. They dropped everything and headed for Africa. The ensuing civil war resulted in a genocide of about 800,000 people, more than a third of them children. Amidst the chaos, as families fled to makeshift refugee camps, thousands of children were separated from their parents. To help reunite them, Reza teamed up with UNICEF to teach the locals how to use a camera to shoot portraits of 12,000 kids. Philippe Duhamel, a UNICEF official, was with Reza at the camps. A very remarkable aspect of Reza's personality was how he quickly interacted with, uh, with the refugees and how many hours he spent sitting in, in the camp and talking to these people, trying to, to better understand their situation and, and why they were there and what were their living conditions. Once the children's photos were taken, Bulletin boards were set up throughout the camps in hopes that parents would recognize their children and learn their whereabouts. Then I thought, oh, but those people, they have never seen pictures, many of them, before. They have never seen the pictures of their children either. And the kids, they were picking up quick. Oh, this is, uh, oh, this is it, and oh, this is it. And the kids became a real vector of the finding those people, more than their parents. Out of a total 12,000 children photographed, 3,500, more than a quarter of them, are reunited with their families. It was one of the most, I think, important, or again, immediate uh, answer that I got from the photography. It's a gratifying reward, but it comes with a price. Reza's work doesn't allow him much time with his own family. Typically, he's home in Paris only three months a year. It's a unique partnership with Rachel that makes his professional life possible. 12, 13 years ago when we met, I had to reach the kind of uh, block Everything now I'm doing or what I am now, it's really because support that Rachel gave to me. Without her, I will not stand here and I will not do what I'm able to do. When I met Reza, he was a photographer, he was a traveler, and I loved him like this. So it was not my concern, and it's not my concern, to change the way he has to live. I'm very confident with his choices. He chooses life, and I choose to love him. Destiny is destiny. I can't do anything for him to stay alive or not. He might die. I will be very sad, of course. It will be very difficult. 
but I will be very happy that he made the choice. And I think I will be very proud to be a part of this choice. Reza's choice is to be on the front line, making war against war with this camera. He came to terms with his own mortality years ago in his prison cell in Iran. What is the price of my life? Why do you have all those millions of the people who were killed? Why my life will be more higher than all the other guys that are killed in this field? Innocent. In the fall of 2000, Reza again puts his life on the line to see his old friend, Masood. It's been eight years since they last met. A bit emotional. I will meet him in a few minutes. It's a great moment, very great moment. This time, the Afghan leader is fighting the Taliban. <laughs> When Reza learns about the atrocities being committed by the Taliban regime, he counsels Masood, come to Paris, tell the story. Masood does just that. In April of 2001, he holds a press conference at the French Senate. The message is ominous. The West is ignoring Afghanistan at its own peril. But Masood's words fall on deaf ears. Afghanistan, at this point, is not a world priority. Reza vows to change that. Four months after Masood's departure, and just weeks before terrorists attack the World Trade Center, Reza comes up with a plan to bring media attention to Afghanistan. Under Taliban rule, freedom of press has been non-existent. Tonight, Reza launches AINA, a media center that will give local journalists the tools and training to cover the news. We have established in the Western countries a lot of organization to help the people in need. But there is not such an organization to help the local journalists, to help them to show us their image of the refugee people, of the ongoing war and forgotten war and forgotten refugee people. The media center's first contribution is a video camera for two Afghan journalists, Fahim Dasti and Yusuf Nisar. Uh, we are happy that people know the truth about Afghanistan and the bad situation uh, and just if they, they could be more um, attentive to what is happening there. Their wish comes true, but at a tragic price. On September 9th, Fahim is injured when two suicide bombers take the life of Masood. Two days later, on September 11th, the Twin Towers fall and Afghanistan becomes the focus of world attention. After years of battle, the warrior is laid to rest. Sadly, the peace he fought for comes with his death. In just three months, his soldiers liberate the capital with the help of the West. Kabul, Afghanistan. Taliban rule is over. Martial law is in effect. It's well past curfew. Only those with a password are allowed to move about. Reza is en route to the only printing house in the city. With his help, Afghan journalists are once again hard at work on the city paper, a weekly that had been banned for six long years. 
It's what Masood dreamed of, but would never see. Somehow, maybe, it's like a friend paying tribute to the dream of his friend. It's just as simple as this. Tonight, the Kabul Weekly rolls off this vintage Soviet-era press. Freedom is in the air. You know, there's one thing in the life of everybody, all the human, that has more value than any other things. And this is freedom. These people were living under occupation of the Soviet army, then Pakistani's army, then Taliban. And for 22 years, they didn't have this feeling of what is freedom. And now, from 13 November till today, it's the face of the people has changed. Even if they are still poor, even if they don't have enough food, they don't have a housing, but who cares about this? They are free. But freedom may be short-lived in a place that has known chaos for a generation. Now, for the second time in 22 years, Afghans have a brief window for democracy. This was a situation in 1990 where the Soviet were defeated. I mean, I have an impression that I'm living the, uh, the same story, one story twice. This time, Reza is determined the story will have a happy ending. Tomorrow, he returns to Kabul to oversee the construction of the media center. At home, his family takes advantage of what little time they have together. New Year's will come early this year. It's a kind of Christmas tree for Persian, for Iranian. Uh, it's for New Year in Iran. It's all starting by the word C. In Persian, Sanjet, Sabzi, Sekke, Serke, and we're missing one, which is Saat. Reza and Rachel don't shelter their children from the harsh realities of the world. Both of them understand how dangerous the dad's job can be. I'm not only French, Iranian children living in Paris, that's it, with their own daily life. No, they're very concerned about the, the rest of the, of the world. And they know perfectly why Reza is going there and why they don't have their father all the time with them. They're, they know perfectly. Sometimes people are asking me, why you go to dangerous places now that you have children? This is the reason that I'm bringing you. When my children will grow up, they will look to my eyes and I say, Dad, why you didn't react when something happening in Afghanistan or in Rwanda or Burundi? Why you didn't go and help those children? And I will not have any answer if I don't do this. New Year's Day, Kabul. Under Taliban rule, all celebrations of this day were banned. Just months ago, the stadium was used for public executions. Now everything has changed. It's so exciting for me to be here. People are coming here, not in stadium, not for execution, but to celebrate. <laughs> Celebrate the spring, celebrate the coming year, the music, the dancing, all things that was forbidden. 
It's like you're coming from a darkest age suddenly to the brightest moment in your life. Besides being the beginning of the spring here now, it's also opening of the schools. While the, the new Taliban, they have forbidden the, the girls to go to the school. And now this is going to be starting of the new era for all of them. It's a really beginning of the, what all the hope of the, for the future of Afghanistan. This is one of the biggest high school, even the best one in the whole country. It's a real one good thing that you have, the only good thing that you have, and you want to show it to everybody. And the Karzai is coming. What the new year will bring is anybody's guess. Afghans in the world are waiting to see what President Hamid Karzai can do. If really West, Western country, they want to reconstruct it, it can take only a year to do it. Just have to give them possibility and money that they need and the material they need, and they will build it in a year. Reza is determined peace will not be short-lived. All his energies are directed toward construction of a media center. This former Taliban building, used for interrogating prisoners, will become a home for free press in Kabul. I'm hoping to bring a lot of teachers from all, all kinds of universities in the world, that they come here, stay months or two months, and teach them different materials. Photography, video, film, high technology, the computer. These are all the plans for this educational plan here. The plans are far-reaching and extend into the community. For Reza, no plan can exist without considering the lives of children. There are an estimated 60,000 street children in Kabul. Reza's ultimate goal is to give hundreds of them an alternative to begging by employing them at his media center. They will earn money by selling newspapers and magazines, and they will start a little uh, a new life, a new way of the contacting with the society. But Reza doesn't want to pick one lucky child from the crowd. Instead, he decides to hold a contest. The child with the best penmanship will be the winner. One of the conditions is that the, uh, the one is, has the best works, but also the more cleaner also. The psychology of the children and approaching them, I think it's very, very important. If you just go to a children and go with the camera, you will ruin your relation with him. You never go and uh, ask a direct question from the children. You know, it's like very aggressive toward him, especially when you see that the, the camera is something strange for him, or, or you are a stranger. And, what they have suffering uh, always was from strangers, strangers, strangers. But then little by little, they come toward me and I became their subject. And this is the time that uh, the money that I'm their subject. And then I start little by little photographing and, and I know that that's it, that the, there is no distance between me and them or between, uh, there is no camera between children and me here. The words are simple, from a 13th century poem written by the Persian poet Saadi. The translation rings true in any language. All human beings are part of one body. If one part of this body is hurt, the whole body suffers. If we understand that all the human, we are part of one body, then I do believe that we will never let other people suffer. We will never let the wars going on. We will never start a war. We will never kill the people. We will take care of all the human 
the same way that we take care of our whole body. In the end, the decision is too close to call. It's a tie. Shafi and Momen will both work for the media center. Shafi, Momen. <laughs> It's here. The hidden object for me is that they can start reading and understanding. Today, Reza is preparing them for their first real job as paper boys. This will give them an opportunity to start getting money and knowing a little, little by little, to understand what are the rules of the businesses in the world. What I do, uh, actually, it's because I love to contact people. I love to talk to them. I love to understand their stories. And even if I have one hour, I would do it in the same way if I had uh, one year to do in the world. This is a real passion for me, to, to, to understand their stories, even the names sometimes, the way that they explain their names, the way that they're saying where they're coming, what they're doing. And that's how I, I have built all my knowledge and everything I know of the world through, those, through them. These are the oldest people which I photograph that gave me their soul and they give me their, their way of the thinking and they teach me also how I should be with the other people, how I should answer, how I should be humble. Back in Paris, the final gavel falls. The Senate auction is a complete success. Through the sale of Reza's photographs, $50,000 has been raised for Afghanistan. But the goal is so much more than just a financial one. Reza is a storyteller. Tonight, an audience learned the tragic tale of a country and its people. If one night could illustrate a life, this could well be it. Finally, I was able to bring those pictures and their voice here in front of those people having all the people coming and thinking and uh, giving me the courage that do the, what I'm doing is correct. So give me more energy and more force to continue.